Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erin Schmidt, and I'm the Director of Pediatric Grand Rounds for Children's of Alabama and UAB Pediatrics. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce four of our distinguished pediatric infectious disease faculty to present an update on COVID-19. Dr. Bill Britt is the Charles A. Elford Endowed Chair in Pediatric Infectious Diseases. Dr. Britt is currently Chair of the Clinical Research and Field Studies of Infectious Diseases Study Section at the Center for Scientific Review, National Institutes of Health. His research interests include CMV and herpes simplex virus. Dr. Celia Hutto is the Medical Director for Hospital Infection Control. She is a professor of pediatrics in the UAB Division of Infectious Diseases, and her research interests include perinatal HIV, antiretroviral therapies, and CMV infections. Dr. David Kimberlin is the Sergio Stagno Endowed Chair in Infectious Diseases and co-director of the UAB Division of Pediatric Infectious Disease. He is the AAP Red Book Liaison to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices and the editor of the 2015, 2018, and two the upcoming 2021 Red Books. His research interests include antiviral therapies for neonatal herpes and congenital CMV, as well as influenza and enteroviruses. Finally, Dr. Rich Whitley is a distinguished Distinguished Professor of Pediatrics, Vice Chairman of the Department of Pediatrics and Co-Division Director of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at the UAB School of Medicine. In 2009, Dr. Whitley was appointed as one of 14 members of a panel advising President Barack Obama about the H1N1 virus. His research interests include antiviral therapies and clinical virology. Um, just so that everybody knows, we likely will go a little bit longer than the hour that we typically run, um, and there will be a brief time for some um, questions and answers at the end that have been pre-submitted to me. Um, but this will also be posted for later viewing in case anybody's unable to continue with us for the full uh, allotted time. Um, we, I will turn it over to Dr. Kimberlin at this time. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm David Kimberlin, Pediatric Infectious Diseases. Uh, these are unusual times, uh, and so there's a handful of folks in the room, most everyone else joining in, and hopefully being able to listen after this so that we can k at least at least give an update as to where things stand right now. You'll see that my update on, in terms of my title of the talk is as of March 19th, 2020, and I probably should have put as of March 19th, 2020 um, at 11.40 a.m. Uh, because things change so quickly, uh, and certainly that's been the case as we've all put these slides together. Let me start with just a little bit of an update on what coronaviruses are. Coronaviruses are RNA viruses. They are relatively stable viruses in terms of their fidelity with respect to replication. They don't have as much shift, for instance, and drift as is the case with influenza, which is another RNA virus. It's the second most common cause of the common cold, uh, rhinoviruses being the first. It tends to replicate at lower temperatures. It also, therefore, at least for the standard coronaviruses we've, we've known of to date, uh, meant that's meant that it's been more in the upper respiratory tract as compared with the lower respiratory tract, although it can cause lower respiratory tract disease. Uh, they are envelope viruses. They are able to survive in the GI tract. That may be of interest to us when we think about uh, the way that the SARS coronavirus 2, SARS CoV 2, uh, the new virus that's causing the COVID 19 disease, uh, the way that that might be a shed, especially in younger children. There are four endemic coronaviruses. You can see them listed at the top of this slide. Uh, and as I've mentioned, they are, are causes of common colds, about a third of the common colds. Uh, they do not induce durable immunity. So people can get infected with each of these four coronaviruses across the period of their lives. What's gonna happen with the newer viruses or newer virus we're not sure of at this particular time. There is worldwide circulation as well as uh, a, a predilection of wintertime and early spring for uh, these viruses to circulate within communities. And none of them have licensed antivirals or vaccines that are available. There are three emerging coronaviruses. SARS coronavirus was uh, uh, prevalent in 2002 to 2004. SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. There were more than 8,000 cases. Mortality was 10%. It affected 32 countries over a three-month period of time. This coronavirus jumped from bats to civet cats and possibly raccoon dogs and then into humans. The MERS coronavirus, Middle Eastern Respiratory Vir uh, Syndrome co coronavirus, caused more than 2,500 cases. Mortality is about 35%. It's affected 27 countries. It's ongoing. You can still have MERS coronavirus cases in different parts of the world. That coronavirus jumped from bats to camels to humans. <laughs> 
And the new coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, has caused more than 100,000 cases. Mortality is not well defined because we don't fully understand the denominator, but it right now is estimated to be in the 1% to 2% range. More than 140 count, uh, countries are affected. We do not necessarily know with certainty what the intermediate host is, but it appears that it jumped from bats to perhaps pangolins, which is this kind of a um, uh, armadillo-like creature you see a picture of, and then on into humans from there. Johns Hopkins keeps a map. Uh, the uh, website is in the upper right portion of this slide. Uh, I downloaded this an hour and a half ago in terms of what the, the current spread of the infection is. 222,000 cases, 9,100 deaths worldwide. And you can see the red uh, spreading out across the world. Uh, and uh, if you watch this day to day to day to day, most of the red circles get larger. The first 425 cases of SARS-CoV-2 were reported back at the end of January in the New England Journal. And this was a, a study that was really described and, and, and uh, referred to a number of times. I think it's certainly been outflanked just by the additional data that have come along. But it's worth thinking about in terms of, honestly, how quickly we learned about all of this. Uh, there were a number of cases. You see the y-axis is, axis is number of cases, and x-axis is uh, specific months and days. And you can see as you start from the left and move to the right, there were you know two to five cases a day uh, in the pre-Christmas period of time, latter part of December in other words. Uh, and then uh, with uh, a number of those being recognized, a case finding study was activated on, uh, on December 29th. Uh, the link to the Wuhan wholesale market, a, a live animal market was recognized. Uh, and uh, that was in the very beginning of January. The CDC declared, that's the Chinese CDC, declared a level two emergency on January uh, 7th. On January 8th, the novel coronavirus, what we now calls, call SARS-CoV-2, uh, was, uh, was um, uh, released to the public in terms of uh, an official announcement from the China CDC. And within two days, uh, the full sequence was shared with the world. This, this is remarkable. We've had a lot of, of challenges. We continue to have a lot of challenges with this current pandemic. But I do think we can take a moment and reflect on the rapidity with which this information was shared. Uh, and certainly, you know, even by the relatively recent past of, uh, of, of rapidly developing scientific information and sharing it widely, this really was, was light speed even compared with some prior successes. Now, this graph kind of falls off as you go across to the right, uh, but those declines likely were due to delays in diagnosis as well as laboratory confirmation. It wasn't a, a harbinger of, of, a, of a waning uh, epidemic at that particular time, and that's illustrated on this slide where the Chinese CDC reported over 72,000 cases. In the, there's time on the x-axis, number of cases on the y-axis. The blue bars are uh, the uh, confirmed cases by date of onset. That's you know disease onset or, or symptom onset. And the kind of yellow uh, orange bars are confirmed cases by date of diagnosis. So what you see here, let's focus just on the orange bars right now. Do you see how they, they rise up and they begin to peak right around you know, early February, around the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th of February, and then gradually start to come down until February 11th, which was the last day of this particular uh, uh, data set being reported. But that reflects the wave that came before, the blue lines that came before. So if I were to speculate where the United States is right now, I would say we're somewhere right in here. So we are seeing the, con the diagnosed cases continue to peak, and all that really reflects as they continue to peak is the prior spread within the community that's been happening right now, not only in, in Alabama, but really across the United States and indeed across the world. The worst is yet to come, in other words. In terms of clinical symptoms, uh, these are, are data uh, from Lancet, and, and these are really overwhelmingly adult data. I, I will have a few tables that will show uh, perhaps some differences with respect to pediatrics, uh, but the majority, 80, 90 percent will have, close to 100 percent will have fever, uh, cough between 50 percent to 80 percent, myalgias in a quarter to a half of, uh, of cases, shortness of breath in about a third, 
less common symptoms, diarrhea and nausea and vomiting, although I will say in pediatrics, those are relatively more common compared with uh, being, what's being seen in the adult population. In terms of disease severity, again, this was a really nice report mid-February, the China CDC weekly report, which is similar to what our CDC publishes as well. About 80% of cases that were recognized at that time reported mild symptoms, about 15% severe symptoms, and about 5% critically ill. Now, the case fatality rate was higher among those people, primarily older adults, with comorbid conditions as compared with those with no comorbid conditions. Those same data looking by age are represented here. Uh, the first column shows uh, age ranges. I've highlighted in red or, or had the font in red for those age ranges that are in the pediatric population uh, and then on out to the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and you can see all the way down. Uh, and you, you can tell just by the, the looking at it, uh, about 1% of all the cases as of February 11 in China that were confirmed were in the zero through nine age group and about 1% in the 10 through 19 age group. This was along with the clinical impression of people taking care of these patients, this was really kind of our first understanding that this may not be as severe an illness in the pediatric population. Looking at these data in terms of mortality uh, and case fatality rates, uh, for the zero through nine, again, for this particular uh, report, no deaths, uh, and for the 10 through 19, one death. Uh, so case fatality rates that are you know, markedly lower than what you see for the 70 to 79 year olds where it's 8% according to these data uh, and for the 80 year olds an over 15% case fatality rate. Now I, I'll, I'll caution again, we don't know the denominator and I'm gonna spend some time in a few minutes talking about what we do know about asymptomatic spread of this virus and, and people acquiring it and remaining asymptomatic the entire time of their infection. And so this is that, as we know more about that over time, ultimately with seroepidemiologic studies, which will be quite a bit in the future, I think we may see these mortality rates go down simply because the number of deaths we know, but the number of total infected will go up as we see more of the asymptomatics. That's my speculation. Uh, this was a report published yesterday. You'll see, you'll see a number of uh, slides that were literally created in the last uh, 12 to 24 hours with data that are flowing out from around the world. These data are from the CDC. It's an MMWR report of hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and deaths. The time period in the United States is from February 12 through March 16. Uh, and again, I, I put this figure up here simply to show on the far left-hand side how small the bars are with respect to the pediatric population. Again, reinforcing that this, this, this does not appear to be hitting the pediatric population anywhere nearly as hard as it's hitting the adult population. There were about 2,450 uh, cases um, that were where ages were known and uh, that's represented on this slide uh, for those that are hospitalized or had ICU admissions or death and if you look at this in tabular form uh, I have it here in terms of hundred and twenty three total cases in people within the pediatric age range if you consider that through 19 um, uh, hospitalizations very low no ICU admissions as reported by the CDC in yesterday's MMWR and no children yet uh, reported uh, to the CDC and published in this MMWR uh, February 12 through March 16. What do we know about incubation time? We've heard a lot about uh, for people that are in self-quarantine being there for 14 days, where did that come from? Well, there's a number of different data sets that have looked at it. This was a New England Journal paper uh, that was published. It was one of the earlier ones. Uh, and what you can see on the Y, on the X axis is days from infection to symptom onset. So the incubation period, if you will. And you can tell that it peaks somewhere in the three, four, five, six day period of time but it then tails off so that you still have a, a few cases between 14 through 21 days following acquisition of the virus. But for the most part, if you're gonna present, you're gonna present within these first 14 days. I'm gonna spend a moment talking about the reproductive number or R naught. This is important. Uh, it's not just an epidemiologic thing or, or a disease outbreak uh, kind of a, a thing. It's something that helps us, all of us, think about 
what's likely to happen with this particular infection. So what is R0, or the reproduction, reproductive number? The second bullet, I think, I think really it's, a, it's oversimplified, but it helps people like me that are not epi folks kind of think about this. On, it's basically the average number of secondary cases generated by one primary case. So in other words, if I'm infected, how many people am I likely to infect on average? And if you look at what we know about R0 for a number of different infections that we're all familiar with, the R0 for measles on the far right is 18. This is a highly infectious uh, viral pathogen measles is. Uh, one person infecting on average 18 people with mumps. One infected person infecting 10 people. So when we think about R0 for, uh, for the SARS coronavirus 2, what do we know? Well, there's been a lot of estimates of what R0 is. This one I thought was most impressive to me because it was a calculation from a confined space in a certain period of time. We may all remember the Diamond Princess cruise ship. This was the cruise ship that was off the coast of Japan and had you know, 3,400 or so people on it. A whole lot of people got infected and they were able to follow these folks and, and calculate what the r naught was. And what they calculated was a 2.3 r naught. That's about what other people are getting as well. So somewhere between two and two and a half people uh, infected for every one person who was infected as a primary case. That's why this thing is expanding. That's why it is spreading. We need to get an R0 less than one. That means one person infected at most will be infecting one other person, hopefully fewer than one other people over time. So when we look at uh, the Diamond Princess and think about it in terms of a proportion that remained asymptomatic throughout, 3,700 passengers, 630 plus had confirmation of SARS coronavirus uh, 2 infection. Uh, they assumed a mean uh, in, uh, time between infection to onset of symptoms, so that period of, of incubation being 6.4 days. And they estimated the asymptomatic proportion, people that stayed asymptomatic for 14 days, um, uh, among all these people on the boat was about 18%. They then did sensitivity analyses where they adjusted that incubation period and they got ranges from about 20% to 40% of all people infected with this virus remaining asymptomatic throughout the time of their infection. So remember that, somewhere around 30% or so on average, 20% to 40%, I'm taking the middle of that. What else do we know? Well, there was a Japanese study of 565 nationals that were evacuated from Wuhan, China by plane. They tested them for SARS coronavirus uh, 2 and they followed them for 14 days. 12 tested positive by PCR. Five of those 12, or 42%, remained asymptomatic throughout that 14-day period. They then stopped following them. But if you estimate that one of those five subsequently went on to develop symptoms, then that takes the asymptomatic uh, rate down to about 33%. So again, about 30% or so. And then there was a highly complex study released in science. I my days are mixed up now, but I think it was either Monday or Tuesday that this came out. Uh, it took me two or three days to to read this and try to understand it as best I could. It uses spatiotemporal dynamics. Um, 375 Chinese cities were part of the model. Um, they looked at two different time periods, three actually, but I simplified it here. Uh, there, uh, the time period before widespread limitations on movement uh, were implemented and time after widespread, widespread limitations on movement were implemented. Prior to widespread movement limitations, the undocumented infection rate, so Technically, this could be the asymptomatic rate, but I like the way they, fra they phrased it of undocumented because they also might have had symptoms and everything was happening so fast they just simply weren't recognized as such. Uh, so during that period of time, they estimated 86% of, of, of uh, infections were undocumented, asymptomatic in other words. This has gotten a lot of press uh, in the lay press as well over these last couple of days. I think that that really is, is a much less relevant number because it happened before people knew to be looking for it or, or right around the time people were learning that they needed to be looking for it. But the second sub-bullet is an important one. These undocumented infections were 55% as contagious as documented infections. So they were about, they were contagious still in other words, about half as contagious as documented, but they were contagious. And this R0 that we just talked about, which I think was 2.32, I believe, from the Diamond Princess, by this mathematical modeling was 2.38 during that period. 
Well, what about after widespread movement limitations? The undocumented infection rate is a proportion of all infections dropped to 35% in this model, again, about 30% or so. And the contagiousness of undocumented infections was substantially reduced, possibly reflecting that only very mild, less contagious infections remain undocumented, or that individual protective behavior and contact precautions have proven effective. I hope that it's the latter. Oh, I guess I'd prefer both too, but, but I hope it's the, the behavioral changes in contact precautions and the R0.99 in that particular model. What do we know about pediatrics? Well, three days ago now, um, Dong et al. published uh, this report of over 2,100 children in China. This was published in pediatrics. They categorized as asymptomatic, which was defined, as you can see on this slide, as we all would think, you know, infected, no symptoms. Uh, mildly symptomatic, these are some URI. They may or may not have fever. Uh, you can see other things as well, including some digestive symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, diarrhea. Moderate is more respiratory, higher fevers, cough, pneumonia, uh, and no shortness of breath, no hypoxemia. And then for severe, early uh, respiratory symptoms, fever, cough, uh, progressing to some cyanosis, uh, oxygen saturations that are low, and then critical, progressing on to the need for intubation. So what do we see from this? 2,143 children in this report. I'm gonna point out that there were, a lot of people have focused on the column of all cases, but if you look at it, there were again these 2,143 cases, but only 731 were confirmed. So about a third of these were confirmed, and it really does make it harder to understand exactly what these data are showing us. I prefer to kind of focus on this middle column of the number that are confirmed, and that's where I would, I would encourage you to kind of look, uh, your eye, uh, focus your eyes as well. What I think is important is to look and see that the vast majority of these were asymptomatic, mild, or moderate. Only 2.5% were severe and 0.4% were critical in terms of their, um, in terms of their um, presentation and clinical course. In addition, the um, age range is listed here as well, and you can see that about a quarter to 20% uh, to 25% are in the 6 through 10 age range. The same for 11 through 15 age range, about a 20% uh, are over 15, and about 12% are less than 1. But if you look at the overall asymptomatic portion, this is about 13% of all these different ages. Now, if we look a little bit deeper into the age breakdown for this, less than one, one through five, six through 10, you can see important part here is, I think it's a little confusing, but these percentages add up to 100 by the column, not by the row. So you can see asymptomatic, mild, moderate, severe, critical. I want us to focus on the less than one-year-olds. The less than one-year-olds comprised 54% of all the critical cases. Now this is still rare, this is still not a common thing, but in terms of looking at who is most likely to be critical, by these data it would suggest that it's those children under one year of age, those that are, less, that are most likely to be critical in the pediatric age range to begin with. And then looking at symptom onset to diagnosis, same sort of curve, looking at the blue line, which is the confirmed line, uh, you know, we're looking at over the first uh, seven days or so, mostly two, three, four days, maybe five days. This is a paper that came out yesterday. Uh, this is in the New England Journal. This is 171 pediatric patients. I am not sure how well this will, uh, will um, project because it was rather small and I, 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 I truncated it to some extent to try to get it even this large. But again, if you look at the age distribution, about 18% less than one, close to 25% one through five, about 33% six through 10, and about 25% 11 through 15. Uh, and uh, if you look at the types of symptoms, about half have cough, about half have pharyngeal edema, about 40% have fever. I now wanna focus down on diarrhea, a little under 10% with diarrhea, and um, about six, seven percent with vom uh, vomiting. So we're seeing that to a greater extent than the adults are seeing in their population. And if we think about asymptomatic, I'll draw your attention here to about 16%. So in the prior study, it was about 13%. Here it's about 16%. Somewhere in the 15% range based on the data we have, and that could change this afternoon, uh, but that would be the percentage of children right now that we think would be asymptomatic throughout their entire course of infection.
And this is illustrated again from these 171 cases reported yesterday in the New England Journal, uh, the proportion uh, that are asymptomatic highlighted in the red box that I've added. Let's talk about transmission. Well, it appears to be a, a, a droplet transmitted infection, and that makes sense for the kind of virus that it is. So that's why we talk about six feet, because that's how far the smaller droplets can travel before they land on surface tops. In addition, having direct contact with those secretions, and that's, you know, spittle that lands on a, a tabletop or a door handle, <coughs> it can include um, uh, blood and, and serum where it's also been detected. These are ways that perhaps uh, the virus can be spread. I'm going to end in a few minutes with some discussions of aerosolization. Asymptomatic transmission is possible. This is a, a, a single case uh, kind of presentation from Germany, but it, it illustrates this well. There was an index case visiting Germany, that's the person in the top kind of row, I guess if you'd say, who attended business meetings during these days. Patient number one and patient number two attended business meetings with this person. Subsequently, they tested positive and were symptomatic. Patient three and patient four had contact with patient one, but they did not have contact with the index case. They did not have contact um, with the business meeting or the environment of the business meeting. And the time that they had contact with the uh, index, I'm sorry, with patient number one preceded the time that patient number one got symptomatic and then patient three and four went on to develop symptoms. This can be spread from asymptomatically shedding people. Where is it shed? Uh, PCR uh, detection in over a thousand specimens from over 200 patients, not broken down by age. It did include pediatrics, but I'm sure this is overwhelmingly adult data. Uh, and there's a lot of information here, including sort of how much virus is present. But the main thing I want you to see is that it can be from the respiratory tract, BAL, uh, brush biopsy from a, a, a bronchoscope, sputum, nasal swabs, pharyngeal swabs. It also can be detected in feces, and it has been detected in blood as well. Now, looking a little bit further about where in the respiratory tract it can be in fact, uh, detected, 18 patients, 144 specimens. The important thing here is the uh, kind of bluish color with the, di uh, with the triangle, those are from nasal swabs. The grayish color with the circle is throat swab. You see higher amounts of the virus uh, from the, yes, because this the CT value is inverted here, higher values from the nose uh, than from the throat. And that, I think, has led, Celia can tell us more, but I think that's led to the reason why the sites for testing has been, have been modified sites in terms of where you where you get samples from very briefly not to give any information on this because it's not published yet but i've reviewed manuscripts for journals that have documented three cases of perinatal transmission i think documented that well um, in utero transmission has been suggested in three cases data are not as solid there but it's provocative now I'll close with mention about uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the environment. This is a, a advanced uh, released uh, document from Van Dorelman and, and uh, colleagues. Uh, it was actually put out two or three days ago, um, and it has exploded in terms of the amount of interest that it's gotten, I'd say, over the last 24 hours. Uh, you can see that what they did, this is in, vi in vitro. These are, these are experimental conditions. This is not human to human. There's all sorts of caveats here, it's good data, good information, but it, 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 this is not documenting that it transmits from person to person this way. You can see that they looked at aerosolization, they looked at time on copper, on cardboard, on steel, and on plastic, and you can see the graphs there, but then taking it into a, a tabular form, um, on uh, the median half-life from aerosolization was a little over two hours. On copper, it could live for a little over three hours. On cardboard, about eight hours. On steel, 13 hours. And on plastic, 16 hours. And this can go on out toward a full 24-hour period of time. So again, things that are interesting. Um, I don't know that they should change our infection control practices other than to you know, be very much aware that this is a droplet driven disease or, or, or pathogen and wash your hands and then wash your hands and then wash your hands and wash your hands uh, and make, be very mindful of what you touch and then bringing that to your face. Um, I don't think right now, for me anyway, personally, that the this, these in vitro aerosolization data change the way I'm thinking about this particular pathogen.
So my conclusions are that children are less severely impacted by SARS-CoV-2 than adults. Infants and children with chronic conditions may be at uh, more risk. Uh, infants under a year of age, in other words. The peak is in front of us. It's not hit yet. Between 20% and 40% of all infected persons and probably around 15% of uh, infected children remain asymptomatic throughout the entire course of infection. Dramatic measures to decrease movement and to decrease socialization can decrease viral spread very significantly. I chose that word deliberately. And environmental contamination is an important risk for transmission along with close personal contacts. I'm going to turn it over to Rich now. I'm sorry, to Bill now to talk a little bit about testing. Uh, I'm Bill Britt uh, from the uh, Division of ID, and at the moment I'm directing the, the diagnostic lab and working with the pathologist at UAB uh, for our laboratory testing for <coughs> SARS-CoV-2. Um, so just, just quickly for a review, this is methods, methodologies used to make diagnosis of virus infections. Classically, it's been virus isolation, which we actually still do for some of the coronaviruses and other respiratory viruses. There's standardized systems, quite simple, quite straightforward to do. The <clears throat> this virus causes cytopathic effects, which makes it easy to follow in tissue culture. And also, you end up with material that you can um, utilize for genetic characterization of the virus, uh, which helps in understanding spread. Huge disadvantages. <clears throat> this is a BASL-3 level. That's just below the most maximal biosafety level containment. So it can't be done in, um, it cannot be done in most laboratories. Expensive long turnaround, and it's really not adaptable to high throughput or high volume testing, which we need for this uh, current situation. The most commonly used ones are nucleic acid <clears throat> amplification. PCR is the most common one. Rapid, scalable, relatively inexpensive limited biosafety issues because we inactivate the virus when we extract the nucleic acid. It can be multiplexed to uh, include many different agents, which we actually do for about 12 or 14 respiratory uh, pathogens currently. <clears throat> Disadvantages, reagent costs and availability. The last one's availability. In a massive uh, uh, effort like that <clears throat> we're now under, undergoing to identify this people with this virus, the availability of supplies has been really limited. And actually, many laboratories have spent days on websites and telephones trying to, to obtain supplies to do their testing. Um, and also, there requires relatively close monitoring for assay performance because although each assays are relatively standardized, it's very important to make sure they're performing because most of these are being reported out as positive or negative. Uh, <clears throat> serology. Not really for this virus. The serologic data I've seen on it is you start to see an antibody response about 10 days after infection. And the, I, as David pointed out on IgM uh, assay for a congenital infection, is, that's really not been validated. So we're not sure whether an IgM assay would even be of value for a rapid diagnosis of this. So the currently available testing for this virus, this is supposed to be SARS-CoV-2, at UAB and Children's is nucleic acid amplifications. We currently are using an RT uh, reverse transcriptase. That is, this is an RNA virus. We have to turn it into DNA to test it um, <clears throat> in a Genmark assay that we use. It's multiplexed with other uh, respiratory viruses. It's relatively rapid, relatively inexpensive, but also supplies are relatively limited because this requires manufacturing of these cassettes. And this company, as every other company, was <laughs> really caught off guard by the, the demand that would be required for this. And they are lagging behind, uh, as, um, as, as I said, from, as are most suppliers. <clears throat> there are RT-PCRs. Again, these are standard plate assays. They use a variety of different assays, the one created at the CDC, one generated at the WHO, and another one in Hong, generated by investigators in Hong Kong and Germany. These are standard assays currently being used in multiple laboratories. And, and um, fortunately, they're, they're really, really scalable. As uh, shown in item number two, the Roche system, which is a COBOS system, which is coming online now, has the capacity to easily test 800 to 1,000 specimens a day. It's automated, robotic, makes it very simple for the kind of testing that we need to do for this agent. Unfortunately, um, a few of those systems are available because of the reagents, as there's significant lag time to obtaining the reagents for that system. 
We're in the process, not at Children's, but at UAB through the Department of Health at, in the state of Alabama to obtain one of those systems that will allow this high volume testing. Thermal Fisher has, Thermal Fisher has another system that's similar. Again, these are robot driven and really uh, designed for uh, large numbers of specimens testing every day, which is probably will be required for the, the public health response to this, to this agent. I'll, I'll stop there. And Rich Whitley will be the next speaker. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rich Whitley. I'm also a member of the Pediatric Infectious Diseases Division. And what I would like to do is explore with you um, what we know about treatment today and uh, where we need to go over the next several days. So I'm going to discuss what our therapeutic options are at the present time. I do want to list my own disclosures because I think they're important. I am on the board of directors for Gilead Sciences. Gilead is making remdesivir. I'm not going to talk about outcome with remdesivir, but it's a drug that you've heard about and you've heard both positive and negative things about. I also received grant support from the NIH to evaluate uh, and develop new therapeutics for SARS-CoV-2. And I am going to discuss non-approved therapeutic indications because there's nothing that's licensed uh, for this indication at the present time. So what are our approaches? First of all, we can take direct acting antivirals. And the best example is remdesivir. And I'll tell you in detail how it was proved to have activity against MERS, SARS, and now SARS-CoV-2. There are antibody approaches, and you'll hear about them more frequently as several companies are developing monoclonal antibodies to administer to sick patients. They're also developing antibodies from patients who've recovered from uh, COVID-19 to see if that was useful for therapeutic purposes. Immune modulators have been considered, the most likely of which are interferons. And then there are repurposed drugs like chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about those later. And then HIV protease inhibitors, ritonavir and lapinavir. And clinical data that were just published today, this morning, would indicate that the combination of ritonavir and lopinavir are not active in the treatment of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and that was a large, well-controlled, placebo-controlled study to determine, determine whether it was effective. Now, I only want to show this slide because it basically points out what David already alluded to. Where do coronaviruses come from in general? And who are the intermediate hosts? Well, we know for some of them, we don't know for all of them. And uh, just remember, probably the one that's the worst is listed at the bottom. And that's the one that we find in piglets that uh, uh, absolutely decimates piglet populations. One up from that is MERS-CoV, uh, which is, um, you, as you well know, is transmitted from camels to humans. And above that, SARS-CoV, uh, and a variant thereof is SARS-CoV-2. So where did remdesivir come from? Remdesivir was part of a screening program that was done at Gilead Sciences against a variety of different viruses. Uh, it included filoviruses, it included paramyxoviruses, uh, and not the least of which was coronaviruses. And you probably read about it being studied in uh, Ebola in West Africa, where it was inferior to antibody pools or antibody cocktails that were developed by Regeneron and one other antibody company. And most people thought the drug would not be of further value in the treatment of any disease, except that it did have activity in Marburg, which is a filovirus models uh, that were studied with the federal government. And it's a drug that, you know, potentially we could use to treat respiratory syncytial virus infections, but probably will not get there. This is a phylogenetic tree that shows uh, the origins of some of the viruses that we're talking about. And David already alluded to OC43, which is the common cold virus that we talk about, HKU1, which is another one. But I want you to pay attention really to MERS, where you see a green and blue box. And I also want you to pay attention to SARS, where you see a blue and green box. And, and the only reason I show that is it indicates the similarity between the coronaviruses for which this drug is active. And if you actually sequence the viruses and compare the, the uh, polymerase for uh, SARS versus SARS-CoV, there's about 96% homology for the two viruses. So what would work for SARS likely would work for SARS-CoV-2. This is what we do in, in the laboratory to try and show that a drug works. 
And these are the kind of data that no one ever shows at Grand Rounds because they would say pediatricians get bored by looking at data such as this. But on the other hand, you need to know what we do and why we think that a drug might work and therefore could be a potential benefit. And if you just look at what uh, each of the boxes are, I'm going to direct your attention to the 0.25 micromolar plus uh, virus, the common cold uh, uh, coronavirus. And what happens when you try and do assays to look at the effectiveness and how the effectiveness of drug changes as you use less and less and less drug so that when you dilute it out to 0.1 micromolar, there's no difference between nuclei and infected versus uninfected cells. We can translate that to uh, laboratory assays, and here are three different types. One is an antiviral assay, which is shown in the graph on the far left. Then a cytotoxicity assay, which has to be done to determine whether or not the effects you see as an antiviral are related to the drug or they're related to cell toxicity. And then percent inhibition and toxicity, which we determine as the IC50. In other words, the amount of drug that will kill 50% uh, of the virus. So what we do here with the antiviral assay is how much can we reduce or not reduce uh, the amount of virus that's in cell culture. And you can see that it, at high concentrations, we can reduce the number of logs detectable by 1 times 10 to the 6. Without evidence of cytotoxicity at similar levels, which means the therapeutic index, at least in cell culture, is acceptable. And we can determine the IC50 to be 0.042 micromolar. Now remember, what we see in vitro is not what necessarily what we see in animal models, nor necessarily what we see in human beings. Um, so this virus was first uh, uh, developed, or this drug was first developed to take into MERS, as David mentioned, the Mideast Respiratory Syndrome. And in fact, uh, as time has gone on, the clinical trial was going to be done with one of our current fellows, Salam, who was going back to the Saudi Republic and has a clinical trial set up using remdesivir uh, to, st to study uh, MERS in his uh, colleagues. Um, what's relevant is with the appearance of SARS-CoV-2, uh, all the drug has gone to treating that disease. Now, what do we learn with MERS? Well, we can do the animal model studies where we can look at weight loss and how weight loss uh, is influenced by uh, the amount of drug that you give. And we can look post-infection and see the infection will decrease the weight. We can see that the drug doesn't influence the weight in other animals, and yet we can see that will decrease the quantity of virus that's in the lung when we appropriately treat these uh, animals. I'm going to show you data on lapinavir and ritonavir in a minute because those are the data that just came out in NEJM today, and it's illustrated here. Again, you take mice, and these, you know, I can go into the details of it, but I don't want to bore you, but they're esterase negative mice because of the kinds of drugs that we're using. And we can look at the actual lung pathology, and we can look at lung function. And this is just for our pulmonologists who like lung function in animal models, so uh, pay attention to it. Here, we can look at lung, lung hemorrhage, first of all, and you can see four days post-infection, six days post-infection. Red is the remdesivir administered animals. Gray is the uh, vehicle. And you can see with the remdesivir treated animals, the hemor hemorrhagic score, which is shown over here on the right, how it's done, is significantly less than in the control group. Whereas when you lose Kaletra and interferon, or Kaletra and ritonavir are not shown here, you don't see the same beneficial effect. Um, we can do the same thing with pulmonary function according to the medication that was administered, whether it's remdesivir or whether it's the counterpart vehicle. And when we do the same thing with Kaletra, you can see that the impact on outcome, particularly respiratory function in these animals, uh, is not as great. Okay, so what does that mean? Where are we today? We only have one real direct acting antiviral, and that's remdesivir. Four trials are underway in Asia. There are four controlled studies in the United States, and drug is available on a compassionate plea basis. We should have a readout on some of these studies by the middle of April, toward the end of April. With a drug that's known as EIDD-1931, um, EIDD stands for the Emory Institute of Drug Discovery. That drug is pending uh, IND approval by the Food and Drug Administration now. 
uh, additional toxicity studies had to be completed before it will go into clinical studies. Then there are repurposed drugs like HIV protease inhibitors, and I mentioned them, them to you. China and the United States have studies ongoing. The Chinese study was reported today. Forget them. Don't use them. Um, there will be uh, opportunities to study better drugs as we move forward. Hydroxychloroquine, a malaria drug, is being studied in China and the U.S. However, we have very little data about the use of hydroxychloroquine to date. There is one small study out of France that's uncontrolled that suggested viral load was lower in those that received drug, but you can't make anything out of an uncontrolled study. Interferons will be evaluated. There's no two way of ways about it. And certainly antibodies from recovered patients as well as monoclonal antibodies will be going into clinical studies very shortly. One thing I want to discourage anyone from doing is using corticosteroids in these patients. Not only do they not help, but it actually makes the disease worse and increases the viral load in these patients. So what's the current management? Supportive care. Uh, remember, diagnostics are reserved for the patients who are symptomatic. And then there are mandatory considerations, not voluntary considerations, but at least from the perspective of the people in the ID division, we would say mandatory considerations. So social distancing. Avoid crowds, you know, m most people would say avoid groups of 10 or more. Six to 10 feet distancing, and that rationale was provided by David. Remember, UAB is using a limited business operation model for the next two weeks, and that'll be a week from Monday before that potentially will change. Cover your cough, hand washing, stay at home. And probably the best uh, quote from Tony Fauci, uh, who is the director of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases was stay home. With that, I'll turn it over to Celia. I'm Celia Hotel. I'm in, in the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases and the, and the Medical Director of Infection Prevention at Children's Hospital. And I'm going to talk to you a few minutes about infection control in the hospital mostly with some comments about um, in practices, hospital practices as well. So I'm going to try to cover, and these are not, these topics are not going to be covered in any detail. I'm going to touch on triage and initial management, transmission and PPE, PPE conservation, which is really important for us in all hospitals, um, but particularly those of us who have not actually had the surge that we are concerned that we will see in the, in the future. Environmental cleaning, testing, hospital and community pediatric practices, and a little bit um, about healthcare workers. <clears throat> so to begin with, um, our, our, um, pract our policies and recommendations are based on recommendations from the CDC and World Health Organizations. In this country, it's mostly from the CDC. Um, so as you know, Many of those recommendations have changed over the last two to three weeks as this infection has evolved, and I will mention a couple of those as we go through this, these slides in the next few minutes. Um, to begin with, it's important to, to identify children who are at risk for this infection, and we've been in do as they enter the hospital from different portals. We've been doing this for the last three to four weeks using algorithms, and this algorithm that you're seeing now is the one that's currently in place, but this algorithm has evolved over the past three weeks as the infection has changed and as we now are identifying patients in our state, we know that just identifying patients based on foreign travel are, um, is not adequate. But we have to identify, we have to use some, some method to identify children who are at risk for this infection and for those who need to be tested now since our testing is, is still limited. So it's our identification and the algorithm is based on symptoms, having fever and our respiratory symptoms. We are asked, still asking questions about um, travel to international areas in particular that are considered level, th level two or level three countries. But really, if they've had any travel at all, it's important to know whether or not there's been a direct contact with someone who has been diagnosed or is under consideration for um, COVID 2019. If those are, um, if any of those patients are identified based on these questions, then it's important that wherever they enter the, the system, whether it be in the emergency room, in outpatient clinics, 
and hospital practices um, are in the inpatient area, patient placement would identify those, then that, that either the clinician or supervisor in charge be notified. And in case of patient placement, it would be whoever the accepting physician is or that the patient is being referred to. <clears throat> So it's important for the people for um, for those areas to know what to do. If a patient's identified, what do we do initially? The patients should not be sitting in waiting rooms. Obviously, if they are identified with with respiratory symptoms, now children with respiratory symptoms, um, sh they should. So if in the ED, the clinic or the practice, they a, play, a mask should be placed on the patient and the patient's parent or caregiver. They should be placed in a single room. Negative pressure rooms are no longer um, recommended, only for patients, they would only be used now for patients who are gonna have aerosol generating procedures. All healthcare workers entering those rooms who are providing care for those patients would wear um, PPE, which we'll discuss in, in, in a few minutes. And it's important that care for those patients, whether in the outpatient setting or the inpatient setting, that care be limited only to patients to healthcare workers essential for the care of the patient. That's to decrease exposure and to decrease the use of PPE so that it can be conserved. And you'll hear that over and over again, decrease exposure, decrease utilization of PPE. Um, while the patient and his caregiver is in the hospital, they should remain in that room unless it's absolutely necessary for the patient to leave for some test, but they should remain in the room with the parent and ambulation by, should be um, discouraged um, while the patient's in the hospital if they're gonna be discharged. And when they're discharged, they should continue to wear the mask until they exit the building. Patients in admitted from the ED, if they're gonna be admitted, they should also wear a mask until they get to the room where um, they will be admitted along with a parent. If the patient is hospitalized, it's important that the, room, that the door to the room be kept closed at all times. Parents are also going to be um, need to remain in the room with the patient as long as the patient's admitted. Uh, meals will be provided for the patient and the parents, and the parents, and they'll be delivered to the floor. And then the nurses, um, dietary will not go in these rooms again. Only essential personnel will need, will be allowed to go in the rooms, and dietary will deliver meals to for the patient and parents to the floor, and they will be then nursing or will take the meals into the families. There, the, there will be no, no visitors to the hospital except in very specific exceptions, except for the parents or caregivers. Only personnel, again, essential for care. And then the PPE for healthcare workers of, um, providing for care for patients should include gown, gloves, face masks, and eye protections. Eyeglasses are not adequate. Um, dedicated equipment for these specific patients will be used and any aerosol generating procedures will be done in negative pressure rooms. And these are again for patients admitted to the hospital. So transmission, um, and this is, this is to help understand about the recommendations for PPE, and which have changed over the last two weeks. So we know that there was an outbreak, as David mentioned earlier, of SARS COVID, um, coronavirus back in 2003, and Based on what we learned from that, we know that a large number of healthcare personnel and patients were, were infected during that outbreak. It, it is, and based on the literature from the outbreak, um, initiators of, of those outbreaks in hospitals were probably undiagnosed infectious patients and visitors. We also know that based on, on data from that study that the virus was most likely, was transmitted primarily through droplet and contact route as David has mentioned, but there was data to suggest that in some cases, airborne transmission may have been important over a limited distance. So that was suggested but not proven, but because of that they data, when this um, pandemic first began, it was recommended that, in, uh, that patients, uh, patients with COVID-19 be placed in negative pressure rooms and that N95 masks be used for care of these patients. That has since changed for a number of reasons. One being uh, we've learned more about it, but mostly because of that we don't really have the resources that we need for right now. And that mean mostly being N95 masks to provide care to these patients. <clears throat> 
So it was based on the fact that there was some suggestion that airborne transmission was important, but it, since we don't have resources, we know there, that recommendation for N95 masks for the care of all patients is no longer recommended. These masks should be used, however, in any patient in which there's an aerosol generating procedure to be done. So what are the, what PPE is recommended? And this was as of the, this week, actually, or, or um, the end of last week. So gown, gloves, eye, eye goggles, or face shields, and a procedural mask is recommended for the care of any patient who's at risk and who's being evaluated. We, um, healthcare workers who are, need to use N95 masks for procedures that are at high risk should be fit tested for N95 mask, and they also should know how to test for a seal prior to the use of these masks. Fit testing is no longer being done routinely on everyone, um, for, but for those who may need N95 mask and have not been fit tested, that can be done on an as needed basis. And there are healthcare personnel in the hospital who can perform fit testing of N95 mask as needed. This is just to show you what the PPE that's um, required. The, in the center is N95 respirator or mask. There are other respirators available. In fact, there's some PAPRs being used by some, um, I think they're by medical individuals in the hospital. N95 mask will not fit on anyone who has a beard and apparently some of our healthcare workers do have beards and they may need to go into rooms of some of these patients. So special PAPRs are available for them. So we, getting back to the shortage, I think it's important that we all are aware of the shortage of PPE in our hospital and throughout the country. The major suppliers have reported two or three weeks ago um, that reported shortages, their inability to provide the uh, PPE, especially N95 masks, but also gowns and other face masks to hospitals. And we know now that there are several hospitals, particularly in areas like Seattle and New York with inadequate supplies and, and equipment are not available. They're having to reuse gowns in some cases and they're reusing procedural masks in some cases. There, um, and this is a critical issue because it's putting healthcare workers at risk. We already know that healthcare workers are a group that's a significant risk for this infection. And it's also putting patients at risk without, because we don't have adequate um, resources. So the, the conservation of the PPE is critical. We all should be aware of it. Um, every day we should think about it as we're using PPE. Do I really need this um, PPE? it's almost impossible to obtain N95 masks now from suppliers. So we're, we really have to conserve what we have in the hospital. So conservation methods. PPE should be used for patients with, in, uh, based on an infection criteria. We will have patients. We have patients now who need it for other reasons other than COVID-19. But we should be aware of what PPE is indicated and when it's indicated. And we should also think about when, it's time, when we can discontinue it and discontinue it based on infection prevention guidelines. Healthcare workers, again, to conserve, we, um, health, only essential healthcare workers, no large team should be providing care to any patient who needs in, uh, PPE, not just COVID-19 patients. Other healthcare workers who, are, who need to, um, to provide care and are not uh, totally essential to daily can, um, to do the daily care, patients should communicate with parents outside the room or patients outside the room or by the phone or patient, uh, video monitoring. And then we're gonna urge nurses to bundle their visits during the day to think about what they need to do and try to bundle visits so they don't have to, to use, increase the use of PPE. Other conservation methods. So screening patients prior to urgent clinical or elective visits is important for respiratory symptoms so that we can they can be rescheduled when possible that's being done now in outpatient clinics excluding visitors that as i said that's that is being done um, that counseling elective surgeries the hospital has just put out um, an, an email indicating that elective surgeries are being canceled in the hospital and then assigning designated areas or teams of healthcare personnel to provide care for patients with suspected to confirm COVID-19. 
and that is being done um, and one of the dearth, dearth floors will be designated soon as a floor where COVID patients with who don't need P, um, PICU care will go will be admitted for their care either patients with COVID-19 or suspected COVID-19. Um, that will both allow us to standardize the care of these patients and to preserve PPE. So the, we can, as I said, N95 masks are at a premium right now. They're difficult to obtain and we only have a limited supply. So there are recommendations under those circumstances to go to extended use of the N95 mask or reuse. Extended use would mean wearing the N95 mask for repeated contact with several patients, but without removing that mask. So if you were um, the care provider on a floor where there are potential patients that needed, you would need a COVID, an N95 mask for, I, I think that's probably going to be unlikely. There could be TB patients, but that's unlikely too. Then that's, that's possible. Um, again, we would only wear it if the patient was in a negative pressure room and, and, and um, needed a procedure in which um, aerosol, aerosol, aerosolized procedures would be done. And so it's unlikely we would have multiple patients that would, we would need to wear an N95 mask. But reuse is certainly a possibility. And that means uh, reusing it by one healthcare provider. They have their N95 mask. It would be used for multiple encounters with different patients and you'd remove it after each encounter. It's important to, to know that after a certain amount of usage, it, it is not as effective. Certainly if it becomes wet, it's not as effective. And it's also important to know that we shouldn't be touching those masks because we contaminate the mask when we touch them. So reuse is important, but with certain considerations. And it, that means one mask for each, for one provider and not sharing masks, of course. Um, so just, just to uh, make, people, make you aware of procedures that generate aerosols when an N95 mask <laughs> is required, these are procedures that, uh, such as sputum, anything that would cause sputum induction, open suctioning of airways, intubation, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, insertion of nasogastric tubes, chest physiotherapy, and non-invasive ventilation. If, if these procedures are required, they should be performed in a negative pressure room. The personnel going into that negative personnel room, in, into that negative pressure room should be those essential for the procedure. That's to protect, to protect both the healthcare worker and again to conserve PPE. And then the healthcare worker should, in, should be wearing, anybody in that room should be wearing an N95 mask, gown, gloves, and eye protection. After, after the, the um, healthcare workers leave, terminal cleaning of the rooms would occur as soon as after procedure is possible, and those rooms would be a priority for true D cleaning, or cl uh, true D cleaning. The and it's important, we forget sometimes the environment, there are gonna be environmental personnel going into those rooms, and they're being trained on the wearing of the um, PPE as well while they're cleaning. And certainly anybody who went into one of those rooms after the procedure was performed, if it was within 30 minutes of, of the procedure, would need to wear PPE, including an N95 mask, because of the potential that the, um, the virus is still, in the, um, is still in the air. Hand hygiene, a word about hand hygiene. It's, a, it's an easy thing to do, but I think sometimes we take it for granted. And from my standpoint, it's the most important procedure any of us can do any time to prevent almost any kind of infection. We can wash our hands. Should be done before and after all patient contact, before and after removing gloves, after removing gloves. We can use soap and water, we can use alcohol-based solutions as long as they're at least 60% alcohol. And, there is, and we should have supplies that are available to everybody. Unfortunately, it seems that that's becoming difficult to obtain alcohol-based, but we still have soap and water. Environmental cleaning. Terminal cleaning of the rooms is gonna be done at patient discharge. Coke, um, True D is gonna be a priority for those rooms where we had patients who had COVID-19. And as I said, anyone entering the room within 30 minutes after that patient discharge should be wearing PPE, including a mask and eye protection. And our environmental um, 
personnel are being trained and told and that that should be the case. We're also asking environmental folks to um, to perform high touch to perform cleaning in high touch areas in the hospital at least once a shift. You'll see you should see them cleaning elevator buttons, hand railings, doorknobs, and public restrooms. Those would be um, cleaned at least twice during the day. The public restrooms, other infection control issues. Um, so visitors again, they're not going to be allowed. There will be some circumstances depending on that when which visitors would be allowed. Um, those would be very specific. However, for COVID-19 patients, again, parents are going to remain in the room with the child when they're hospitalized. We are limiting appointments, outpatient appointments, to those who require visits. Others are being rescheduled. The parents and the patients requiring appointments if they have respiratory symptoms are going to um, we're going to screen them if they prior for respiratory symptoms so we can be sure that they wear a mask after as soon as they enter the hospital and they'll wear a mask until they're in a room with a door closed in a clinic and then they'll wear the mask until they leave the hospital and testing is also i think an important part of of um, infection control not so much just for inpatient for inpatients but for the community We've been, we are limited now in how much we can test just because we're limited in, the, in our testing ability. But as soon as we have increased testing, I think it's important that we discuss this, but that most children coming into the hospital be tested. Test, identifying children, even if they're asymptomatic, can allow, uh, allow the, us to tell parents they need to be isolated for a certain period of time. It can also help to help determine if there are family members who may be at risk in that home and they can be isolated from those family members. We have to remember that some of many of the children that we care for are being cared for by older older um, grandparents or, or, or individuals who are not their, their parents and they certainly are a group who we know to be at high risk for significant disease. So testing children and getting those children isolated, making parents aware is important. So we have a diagnostic pathway that we're currently using for, diag for determining um, which children are going to be tested for COVID-19. This is, was adapted from um, a pathway, diagnostic pathway that was, it was being used at, that is being used at University Hospital. And it's categorizing children according to risk. And, and also it's um, categorizing them by, by risk. They're also determining the type of uh, PPE that is recommended. But just to focus on the diagnostic category, so we're, we're recommending that any child who in the outpatient setting, and at least in clinics, are in the, are in the ED, have a rat initially if they have fever and, and respiratory symptoms, have a rapid flu ob obtained. If it's negative, then of our respiratory panel. And that for some children who are going to be at high risk probably because of their underlying disease, and those would include children with chronic lung disease, children with chronic cardiac disease, probably children with, who are immunosuppressed, and, and um, children with diabetes. Some of those children would need to consider um, a, a COVID-19 testing as well. If the rapid flu is positive, we could can discontinue contact precautions and continue droplet precautions. If the respiratory panel is negative, then COVID-19 and those children who did not receive testing um, would, be con would be done in those at risk. And all of the those children would continue on droplet and contact precautions. So this is um, community practices. It's important that we think about those. We have hospital practices. There are other community practices. So, some, so I think it's important to provide some recommendations for those who and many of those patients are going to be coming to see us in the hospital. Some recommendations, and they, and they really are limited in their resources in terms of PPE and testing, really. Um, so scheduling patients, they could scheduling patients and accompanying parents should be triaged for respiratory symptoms and fever. I, the practice the practices could develop an algorithm for patients who could be managed at home and most of these children can be managed at home and in fact it's to their advantage to be managed at home and those who need to be seen um, then the, uh, so they could distinguish between those that could be managed at home those that need to come into the office or those that need to be referred to the ED.
It's important to separate, if they can, patients with respiratory symptoms from those without into different waiting rooms. Um, even to use different entries into the clinics or the, the practices if possible. To put, put, put masks on those children with respiratory symptoms in the waiting room, in the, in the practices and as soon as possible um, after entering the practices. If possible, to separate children with respiratory and symptoms from those well child and non-respiratory patients by seeing them either at a different time of day, maybe in the morning, and then seeing the children with respiratory symptoms in the evening or on different days of the week. And then healthcare workers in the clinics who certainly wear PPE if they have it available, and hopefully most of them will. And then one word about healthcare workers. Knowledge of infection control practices in the hospital and outpatient setting is essential for healthcare workers, including the use of PPE and the conservation of PCE, PPE. They should be, we should all be, encouraged to stay home if we're having respiratory symptoms and to notify our supervisor and to notify um, employee health. We should be aware of, of the recommended work restrictions and monitoring based on exposure to COVID-19. And there, and there are contingency plans for increased um, absenteeism because of ill employees or family members. And the last slide I'm going to show you is a website that you can access. There are a lot of resources being put. Um, this is the Department of Pediatrics website. It, we will update it. We will add resources available. There are a lot more details about, the, about providing care to these children and infection control for the hospital. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to everybody. I have a few questions that have been submitted from um, some of the Department of Pediatrics faculty members that mm -hmm. if you guys will allow me to, I'll kind of go through and um, get you guys to answer. Um, one of them, so there are some case series in pediatric patients coming out, one from China recently that indicate co-infection may be fairly common, up to 40% in one series that was published. Using our algorithm, if the VRP is positive, we have the potential to miss patients with um, COVID. Is there any, um, consideration of testing all of our patients with respiratory symptoms at some point as our testing um, capabilities expand? I, <clears throat> that, that is a great concern. I was informed today by somebody from UAB that a recent uh, report came out of Stanford that said up to 20% of the patients with SARS with COVID-19 actually have a, are infected with other respiratory viruses. So it's uh, <clears throat> confusing at this point, and our algorithm is imperfect. Our algorithm is to test them all, all uh, patients. Unfortunately, the availability of testing right now has uh, limited that, and we're trying to prioritize that so that we can test the, uh, the, the, um, the most likely patient to have this illness. On that note, several people have asked when we might have capability to test our patients at Children's internally. This will probably be you again, Dr. Britt. We have that capability, but the capability, again, is limited by reagents and supplies, and we're trying to expand that. Um, I would like not to say exactly when that will happen, but hopefully in the next, uh, within the next week, we can expand and test uh, more and more of our patients. Again, but this is dependent on suppliers and availability of, of uh, testing material. Thank you. Um, it was discussed that corticosteroids can potentially worsen disease and increase viral load. Um, with our patient population, especially inpatients who have a high prevalence of asthma, does that affect how we treat patients with asthma who potentially also concurrently have COVID too? And does that include inhaled corticosteroids or is that just systemic? Right now it's just for systemic corticosteroids and for patients who've been on corticosteroids for long periods of time, it's not the same thing as bursting them with corticosteroids, which is what the real risk factor is. So at this time, best of our knowledge, we could potentially still treat our asthma patients with standard of care yes. steroids? Okay. Um, and on a kind of similar note to that, there has been some discussion, um, it seems like kind of more in the community about avoiding ibuprofen in COVID patients. Is there any merit to that or is that one of these myths that's going no well? No data. Okay, no data to support avoiding ibuprofen. Um, uh, probably this would be directed with, towards Dr. Hutto. Are there any updates on um, if and 
when potentially healthcare providers would need to be considered for testing or is it purely based on symptoms at this point? I, again, I think it depends on when we are avail, able to do the testing based on the availability of kits. Um, you know, we would like to be able to test anybody who needs the test and it, that it's reasonable to test, but it, we're just re limited by our kit and testing availability. Our capacity is just not where it should be yet and where we hope it'll be very soon. And I would add we're working with the hospital on, you know, establishing what, what as the kits do become more available, what that process will be uh, in terms of how to get the okay, the green light to be tested. Who would okay. get tested, what, how they would get tested, where they would be tested, those kinds of things. Okay, so more information forthcoming yes. as we have the supplies needed um, to be able to do this, okay. Um, I think one final question that I have, and anybody else who's in the audience, feel free, um, our limited audience, I might add, um, is high flow nasal cannula considered to be non-invasive ventilation and therefore would be an aerosolizing procedure? Yes. So high flow nasal cannula definitely is. We know that nebulized albuterol, nebulized medications as well, is the, the swab um, process itself of collecting the nasopharyngeal swab and aerosolizing procedure. I, didn't, I neglected to mention that that was changed. That was something that, that has changed over the past seven days. So it was considered to be a procedure that could gen potentially generate um, aerosols, aerosols. And it most likely was related to the, the Alabama Department of Health's um, recommendation initially until this past, well, on the 16th of, of March that we get both oral and nasal swabs. Getting oral swabs would, of course, potentially increase the coughing, which could generate aerosols. They no longer recommend that, and they're, um, they're only recommending nasal swabs. They're also recommending that N95 masks are saying that they're no longer indicated that that procedural mask can be done, used to obtain nasal swabs. Okay, I think that is all of the questions that had been submitted to me. Anybody else who is here with questions? Okay, the question is how do we get fit tested for N95 masks? So for our children of Alabama, the educators on each of the floor units will be able to provide fit testing as needed for employees who need to um, be tested. And if we're running into any roadblocks, um, call infection prevention on call and they should be able to help arrange that. Thank you to Dr. Kimberlin, Dr. Whitley, Dr. Hutto, and Dr. Britt so much for your presentation today and that will conclude our session.